research focuses on building interpretable machine learning, and the vision of our research is to make humans empowered by machine learning and not overwhelmed by it. Before joining Brain, she was a research scientist at the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and an affiliate faculty in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington, and she received her PhD from MIT. Please help me welcome Dean. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? All right, awesome. Tell me once you start not hearing me. All right, so I'm Bean. Uh, I'm at Google Brain. This, yes? Someone was saying. All right, okay. Um, I'm at Google Brain. This is work with a lot of awesome people inside and outside of Google uh, listed here. I'm curious, I'm sure some other speakers have done this, but I'm wondering if we can, if we can do a raise of hands of, so that I have a sense of who has how much experience in machine learning. Um, who has trained a machine learning model of any kind? Oh, who has uh, trained deep learning through neural network of any kind? Uh, who used TensorFlow? Just kidding. <laughs> who used PyTorch? <laughs> oh, very interesting. Uh, who has, uh, do you regularly read deep learning papers? Oh my, uh, have you read interpretability papers? Oh, have you tra not trained a used interpretability method? All right, have you, <laughs> have you designed your own interpretability method? All right, cool, all right, this gives me a really good idea. All right, so I'm gonna talk who doesn't want to start their talk with XKCD? So here's XKCD. You have a friend asks, asking a friend, this is your machine learning system. Yep, you pour your data into this big pile of linear algebra and then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers were wrong? Well, just to stir the pile until they start looking right. So now you have all trained, most of you trained the model. Who thinks there's some truth in this cartoon? Right, yes, I, I agree too. I think there's some truth in this cartoon. And is that a problem? I think so, because this machine learning is a such a powerful tool. We use it to make money, uh, perhaps help people improve their lives. And there's this whole industry and hype around it, which myself and perhaps you also are part of. But when you use this powerful tool without knowing how it works, you might do something that you didn't intend to do. So last decades, the machine learning community has been responding to the need of understanding how this tool works. This is a number of papers I just Googled, scholar, search. And it's really, but it's really important to know that this is not a new problem. Who here uh, read expert systems paper in 80s and 70s? Yeah, so a, a few of them, a few of you, the problem of interpretability has already, we already thought about this as a community back in the days. But I think it's safe to say that we quite haven't solved the problem. So why now? Why do we care now? Complexity and prevalence. Complexity. We have a lot of computers. Computers are cheaper. We can put a lot of data in those cheap computers. We can make models a lot more complicated than we could, we could have done ever before. Things are more, much more complex than before. Prevalence, they're everywhere. Let's say you wanna uh, uh, escape from technology and you wanna go camping this weekend. Chances are that the way that they manage the storage of your camping equipment, they might be using machine learning too. So it's everywhere, so we now have to care. But you might say, well, hang on, but I heard this thing that decision trees are interpretable. So maybe, and it is this an important question, if that's true, then we should all study decision trees and we should just optimize hell out of it and, and then we, we are done, right? So let's do a little bit of exercise. I'm gonna uh, have sh show, do an, uh, an action. You, at each slide, I'm gonna show you a tree looks like this and you follow whether there's more than 100 people in this room. I think there's more than 100 people in this room, would you say? Yeah, less than 200, I think. Okay, cool. And uh, it, it is definitely not rainy because it's California. And once you do yes and yes, less than no. So it's a no and yes, and you will stop, okay? So at each side, I'm gonna, you're gonna see three trees. 
I'm gonna have you do the action as soon as you, you know the answer, okay? Don't be afraid, no one's judging. All right, you ready? All right, I think pretty, oh, this is the left hand, some, some right hands and some left hands. <laughs> <laughs> weather is sunny, yeah, different time zone, that's true. Maybe they're, uh, weather is sunny, yes, and then time is morning, left. Oh, maybe it was confusing, oh yeah. It's not the mirror image, but you're, yeah. Okay, so it's left hand. All right, now I'm gonna add one or two more layers to this tree, okay? And I would like you to do the same thing. You ready? Your pressure. <laughs> All right, there's some hands, kind of shy hands raising, and some clapping, a lot of clapping. All right, let's see. Sunny, yes. Morning, yes. Uh, 19, yes. Free coffee, yes. So clapping. Great job. <laughs> some folks made a mistake. All right, last slide. Just a couple more layers. Okay, last slide. You ready? <laughs> All right, some hands, confident hands, the right hands, and some clapping. All right, let's see. Cloudy, no. Ear, greater, yes. Afternoon, no. Ear, greater, yes. Photo people, less, no. People in the first row, less, no. So I think it's clapping. Good job. So this has five to six features. This is a very small data, five to six features. And this is like five layer tree. It's like a really toy problem in machine learning, right? In addition, well, can, you, can someone tell me what the overall logic was? What was like the takeaway of this tree? Is there a theme? It's hard, it's really hard, right? And remember this is five feature, five to six features and five to six layers. So it is not true that decision trees and even linear models are always interpretable. So maybe it was a problem with the interface. Maybe like trees branching coming out of everywhere was just not good. So maybe something like rules, rule lists would work. Something like this, you have, uh, if, if these, this was not true, then you go to ski. Or not. You, if you wanna check whether there's a new episode of Rick and Morty, you have to check everything else was false. So maybe rule sets, something like this. So clump them together into sets. So or or and relationship between, uh, between modules or not. It gets very, very complicated very quickly. Again, very small number of features. And this is really not to say that these methods don't work. The point is that depending on what you're trying to do, there's no one size fits all solution. You have to study what the task is. Some solutions, these solutions do work for some applications. So I, I hope I convinced you that we still need to uh, stay in for the rest of the lecture to, to hear what other people did in their work. Then you might say, well, that sounds hard. Even five layer trees are too complex. So is this possible at all? Is this even, even are we ever gonna get there? Like there's this superhuman performance network like AlphaGo, uh, are we ever gonna understand it? Well, the point of interpretability is not about understanding every single bit about the model. It's about understanding enough that it's such that it's helpful for your downstream tasks or goals. So that sounds good. So now once you write down what your goals are in mathematics, then you optimize for it and you're done, right? Um, not quite, and I'll get to that in a bit, but let's just define what our goal is. My goal uh, of inter for interpretability, and yours might be different. In fact, I'll come back to what your goals might be because you're all scientists from what I heard. Uh, but my goal is the following. I think the goal should be building a tool so that we can help people use machine learning more responsibly. I really do believe that a lot of people want to do the right thing. Like they build this model, so serve big uh, population in the world, 
and when they add a new term in the cost function, they really do want to understand what's the impact of that extra term, what kind of feedback they would create, what kind of social impact they might have. But a lot of times they may not have the right tool to investigate and answer that question. So the tool that makes that, enables that, help that, that answering that question in some way is useful and that is my goal. So this is, these are not com uh, per, uh, complete lists, but some of the list of how, how do we help. One, I think the tool should help you make sure that your values are aligned in the model, such as fairness, and your domain expert knowledge, such as medical knowledge or scientific knowledge, is well reflected in the model when you want it. And I think it's extremely important that we keep in mind that this is not just for computer scientists or you guys who all have trained uh, neural network and uh, machine learning models or neural networks. It has to work for everyone. Medical domain, like doctors, uh, they have critical knowledge to make the right decision, but they may not have computer science or machine learning background. It's rare to see you have MD and CS PhD. They do exist in brain. There are a couple of them, but it's rare. But those are the times when the interpretability becomes most critical. It's also important to talk about what are not our goals. It's really not our goal to make everything interpretable. There are plenty of applications out there where interpretability is overkill. You just don't care that much, so don't spend energy on that if that's not your goal. It's not about understanding every single bit about the model, but also it's not about against developing like AutoML, other complex network architectures. We just have more work to do. And importantly, it's really not about gaining trust. Gaining trust and interpretability is a separate problem. In fact, if you're only interested to gain trust, the best strategy is to look at psychology because humans are very easy to deceive. There's accumulated results that were very gullible. And if that's only your goal, you should just look at that, not what about uh, revealing truth, which is what interpretability is about. What do I mean? There's this recent paper, a beautiful paper that came out a couple months ago, that where they show that they thought, given a medical image, uh, machine learning is capturing something to predict some, some facts about this patient, whether the patient will deteriorate after hip fracture. But they found out later that, oh, it was really reading which machine the image was taken, what kind of the model of the machine was, all the confounding variables that you don't machine, want the machine to uh, take, get a signal from. And in this case, what interpretability methods should really do is to tell the truth and tell the, tell the humans that you should not trust this model. So that sounds good. Now we uh, just go back and write down what our goals are and you optimize mathematically and that's a great, that's a, that's a great start as a computer scientist, right? But not quite. Because interpretability is fundamentally underspecified problem. What does that mean? Well, I'll give you some examples. Safety. Can we figure out all the possible unit tests for which if a car passes, then it's a safe car, safe autonomous car? No, right? If you're familiar with the trolley problem, the moral discussion between, uh, in, in, in interesting discussion where um, hypothetical problem, you're driving a train, if you pull a lever, you'd kill these four people who happens to be uh, roped into the train wreck, or you kill this one person, and you, you only have two solutions, right? And they ask you questions about, what do you think if this one person was pregnant? What if this one person was uh, related to you? This is like really difficult question, hypothetical. But that kind of shed light into, uh, there is no right answer. It's a very difficult question, underspecified problem, what safe autonomous driving is. Science, this is a, this is a good, good audience for this. Science, you can do machine learning to discover something new, and it's something new, so you don't know how to write a loss function for that, so it's underspecified. Other times you might have mis mismatched objectives. What do I mean? You're a doctor, you wanna help the patient, but you didn't know that some of the side effect that this patient might be uh, uh, sensitive to 
weight gain, depression. You wanted to help the patients, but you just didn't have all the variables. And you, so you couldn't write the right objective, although you meant well. All under specified problems. So because it's a, a challenge in a problem definition, it's not something more data or clever algorithm can help. In fact, if you think about it, the regular supervised machine learning has similar problems. Because accuracy is a great start. I mean, much better than, uh, much more specific than interpretability. But is accuracy everything you ever want? Maybe it's precision. Maybe it's recall. Maybe it's something about this particular group that you definitely want to protect. Maybe it's about accuracy in that group. How do you define that group? Coming up with a metric or clear mathematical problem definition of your problem that exactly achieves your objective is a hard problem. So hearing this, you sound like, well, it sounds like everything is under specified problem, right? Are you saying that we need interpretability for everything? Well, no. Um, there are models that where the only thing that you care is performance. Um, probably a good example is like AlphaGo. I find AlphaGo amazing. I wasn't involved in, in any of those. Because the way that it does place uh, Go is so different from how humans would have done it. And Go players would look at the, how they play the move 37, and they got excited. They see, like, this is an, an alien Go player. It's beautifully playing this. I would like to learn from it, right? And that kind of uh, problem, perhaps you don't need interpretability. It's a beautiful problem as it is, and you're learning something. Stock price is something, that, something else that I usually example, but it depends on what, how you feel about financial um, finance, finance businesses. We also don't need interpretability for sufficiently studied problems, like airplanes. How many people, maybe this audience actually, how many people know exactly why planes fly? Right, and not in theory, but in practice. Like you measured it, you, did, you, you used the pitop and measured the pressure, you Navier-Stokes know, equation, you measured it. It's, it's hard, I don't really exactly understand. I, I, I'm from mechanical engineering background, but I trust it. Because I'd rather take plane to go to Boston than a uh, road trip. It takes a long time. So I trust it. And I think most of the time it works, right? So <laughs> it's a good, great timing, I guess. So I would rather use that, and I don't, I don't worry about that too much. So if machine learning comes to a stage where a lot of people kind of accept it because empirically you, get the, you accept the risk, then you may not need interpretability and some other uh, times when you don't want people to game the system, maybe you don't want to reveal everything. A good example is a, is a credit card score. So we don't, need all, we don't always need interpretability. So that sounds good. Once you decide that you need interpretability, that's great. Then it comes with all the cousins, fairness, accountability, trust, and causality, right? Not quite. Uh, fairness, trust, and, and other things are not the same thing. Interpretability may help these guys reveal fairness problems, uh, 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 perhaps help users to gain trust, but not the other way around. There are different problems. So great, so now you have uh, all the goals and, and, and everything in mind. Now you made your beautiful interpretability method and you go, okay, here's my method. Look at this picture, it's beautiful. And uh, that's it because there's no good way to evaluate interpretability method. I hear this a lot, and I think it hinders uh, progress of this field because we can evaluate interpretability method. It's uh, the idea that I'm, I'm going to uh, speak a little more about this. The, the high level idea is that you can make a toy data set such that you know where in the image, for example, is important, should be important because you made up the data set and test whether your attribution method, for example, which, that identifies which part of the picture is important, is doing the right thing. So I'll talk about that a little bit. So you can evaluate interpretability method. All right, so now we're gonna go into actually studying the technical stuff, doing well on time. All right, so before jumping in, let's talk about some ingredients for interpretability methods. First, you can think about interpretability as some optimization problem where you have some quality function that evaluates your explanation E. 
and your goal is to, under this quality function, you want to find the best E that maximizes that quality function. And that quality function can be measured via human, uh, human experiments. You test with the final end user, like doctors, and see whether the ultimate goal has been achieved. Did you save more people? Or did you help them do something faster? Or it could be some quantitative measure, which I will also talk about later. You need a model. Depending on your complexity in your model, if you have a linear model like this, you're in good shape. It's a lot easier than if you have something more complicated like this. I mean, this is nowhere near complicated as higher, higher dimensional function, but you get the point. Data matters. If you're super lucky, and I don't think any of us are, that you, ha you have a data completely linearly separable, good shape, you're great, uh, you, it's gonna be easy. But typically we see data like this, where all the, each class is crossing over the decision boundary all over the place. Now you have to explain this complex data. Humans, the end user, the customer matters. The only reason that we have interpretability method is for final human consumption. And who the human is, the final user, is very important and fundamentally changes the problem of interpretability method. If you're a newbie, then uh, that I can, uh, if, you're, if you're more an expert, I can compact a lot more information. Things that you might want to learn from the model might be very different from if you're a newbie. Task, very, very important. Uh, depending on what you're trying to do, whether you're interested in understanding the, the overall what model does for this particular class of credit card approve versus credit card reject, is different from if you, or if you want to just explain this one person, one customer who's complaining why he or, uh, uh, her, uh, his or her credit card was rejected. The former was global. And if you're just interested in one data point, that's we call local explanation. <coughs> and of course, it depends on low and high task domains. Sometimes you have a lot of time to look at one data point. But if you're a medical expert and you have to make a decision like this, then you don't have that much time. So there's a lot of trade-off that you have to think about when you design these methods. There are three types of interpretability methods. We're gonna go through some more briefly and I'm going to spend a little more time here. First is explaining data. You don't have any models, no models included, but you just wanna look at the data and get some understanding of how your data look. Is it garbage? Does it, is it missing too much, uh, too much fields? In fact, uh, a lot of problems that you see in the real world or, or in research problems, problem comes from data. You have to look at data. A lot of times it will answer your question why your model is being funky. Second, uh, building interpretable. So the, in that case, we have no model, but conditional human data task. You, your goal is to learn explanation. Ah, remove, uh, ignore that, that, that I didn't mean to put it there, no models. Uh, second, you might have a bandwidth to build a new model, Move model build a train a new model from scratch so that it's inherently interpretable. So we'll go over some methods, how you might be able to do that. But sometimes often at Google, uh, you have a linear model that a lot of people worked on many, many years. I can't just like come in as a new Googler and say, ah, I'm gonna change your model. Let's now use all interpretable model. That just doesn't work. So then in that case, what do you do? Well, you have to try your best and given a fixed model that you cannot change, how can you do your best in interpreting them to reveal uh, interesting questions, answer interesting questions. Explaining data. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, it's a long lecture, so I'd love questions in the middle. I remember when, I'm in a, when I was in college, an hour and a half lecture is long. Like if I'm interested in a subject like psychology, I'm like in, but if I'm listening to like chemistry, sorry for chemist in the audience, <laughs> I, am, I am like falling asleep. After 45 minutes, I'm gone. So please ask questions. If you're falling asleep, then you can stand up and stand in the back. That's no problem, okay? Questions welcome. All right. So first, explaining data. Uh, we have a running example, a simple 2D data. You have first class, blue circle, and then red axis. Two, two classes, two dimensional data, simple. 
Well, one simplest possible way, and I hope you're doing this, is by getting the mean and standard deviation of these data for, for two classes. So for instance, if you gather these two classes, have like a couple features and they completely overlap, then you kind of have no hope. Uh, you have less hope, I should say. Maybe you can project it in some weird manifold and you'll be fine. Um, but you can see that it's going to miss this guy, this, this lonely guy here. If you're just counting up the majorities, then this guy is going to left alone. So maybe there's a better way. Um, it's widely known as exploratory data analysis. If you're coming from uh, HCI and visualization community, there are a couple of other names. But the idea is basically just help people parse this complex data a little better by either making the interface better or uh, build in some backend algorithm to help you understand better. And I'll talk about one of them soon. One way to do this is instead of giving you just a mean and variance, I'll give you an example. So let's say, oh, now we have a one data, let's say we cluster them. And instead of saying, oh, the mean is like two and three, I give you this picture and say there are two clusters, one cluster dogs look like this, the other cluster dogs look like that. Simple, k-means works surprisingly well. But what about these guys? They're gonna be left alone. And sometimes when your classifier or clustering method is acting funky, very often that these guys are the problems. So you definitely wanna know about these guys. So here's a one way to do it. Uh, we, what we did is, is a paper from 2016 Europe. Uh, we picked a prototype that is kind of majority, that represents the majority. And then given we fit a distribution over this prototype first, and then given that, we try to learn another distribution that captures the difference between majority and the overall distribution. So we want to capture these minorities that are not too minor, like it's not outlier, but it's significant enough that you have to see. Uh, and we, of course, uh, leverage this kernel MMD trick that uh, gives you really nice guarantees and computational efficiency. And here are some uh, examples, results. We have two dog classes, prototypes. You see the face of the dog and, and pretty typical pictures. For criticisms, we see dog in a rabbit costume, pretty cute, Santa Claus, black and white picture, pictures with dogs without their kind of face, their faces are hard to see. So those are some examples of explaining data itself. Of course, I'm so swiping a huge uh, body of literature in visualization and HCI community, their work under the rug. Uh, but there's a lot more work that we have to do in, in this domain. I'm not an expert in HCI, so I always, uh, whenever I go to HCI conference, I'm like, please help us, we need your expertise. But next up, we're gonna now build a model. Next type of interpretability method is building inherently interpretable models. So what are they? Again, our data points uh, two classes. First, Simplest, uh, first not simplest, one of the simple way to do it is learn rules. You've seen this before, a decision tree is a type of this, this uh, style of modular medium that, that you use. There's lots of rule lists, uh, rule sets, lots of work has been done, especially Cynthia Rudin uh, from Duke has done some great work, including uh, learning certifiably optimal rule list. So you can run this and you have the optimal, under some assumptions, you have optimal rule list. Another way, but rule may not work for you. Like let's say if you're uh, looking at pictures, you can't really, based on one pixel, divide the picture. That probably doesn't really much make sense. So there are a lot of other ways. You can fit a simpler function for each feature, for example. So here, there's a lot of blue dots here and I projected it onto this dimension, the, the X, X, F, F2 dimension, uh, sorry, no, X, F2. I got rid of the F1 and I projected everything to F2 and you might have some nice distributions like this. And in fact, there's a nice family of method called uh, generalized linear model. Uh, Rich Caruana did some awesome work on this, where you can, uh, these are just uh, uh, kinds of generalized linear models. You can fit a linear model, of course, uh, or you can put another function on your prediction variable y, and again, have a linear model. 
you know, sin sinusoid uh, functions are a type of this. You can make it a little more expressive by fitting functions for each feature. That's another way to do it. Uh, and, and what Rich Carana showed in his paper in 2000, uh, I'm forgetting a while ago, is that he can match a highly uh, expressive neural network's performance with his simple generalized linear additive model. He added a one more terms for that captures inter two feature interaction, but that's it. He was able to make a model that is as good in the prediction accuracy as neural network. Another method you can do is model distillation. So you have a complex model, a neural network, and it did all the heavy lifting. Then you train another model using input and output of that model. So you forget about the true label. Now you're training a model using the input and predicted label from this heavy lifted neural network. And you build a simple model using that. And that's called model distillation, a type of model distillation. You can do it in just by removing some layers, which is what, what happened in, in this paper, uh, or you can learn a tree. You can learn a model for a part of the neural network with this complex function, or you can try to distill the whole thing, which is obviously harder. What I really find powerful from my experience is example-based interpretability methods. So what it is is similar to what we looked at in k-means, Instead of saying that this class is either based on this rule or uh, this function, we just give you the example. This class looks like these dogs. This class looks like this, this other animal. Why is this powerful? Humans use a lot of context in their reasoning. In fact, there is a, a famous studies on studying firefighters where they, the way that they make quick decisions, when the thing happens, they're like this, when it comes to, okay, you go there, you go that post, and we're gonna do this. And the way that they do this is what they call recognition prime, recognition prime decision making. And what that is, is they basically think about all the, other, okay, all, all the other incidents that they had dealt with in the past, and they map the solution and modify that solution to this new problem. And they do that iteratively. They don't use rules, they don't use functions, they use examples. So, and I find this is really powerful in, in like medical cases too. If you're a doctor, it is better to uh, talk about a group of patients using the very patient that you dealt with and you thought about and you know their histories, uh, their medical histories. I find this usually very powerful. So now we're gonna move on to the last topic don't worry, this is going to be a little longer than other, the other two. Post-training interpretability methods. Any questions so far? Okay. Well, all right. Again, our data points. Now we have a model. You gave me the model, and the model looks like this. Cool. You fit some function for red, some function for blue. One way to do, one way to do add post-training explanation is simply get rid of the one feature and see how it looks like. And that's typically called ovulation test. So for example, if you have a picture or a categorical data, you remove one of the factor like age and see, so basically just shuffle that uh, feature. Now the age doesn't give you any information. It's not a real human. And see how much the accuracy drop. If the feature was holding a significant signal, then accuracy will drop more than if it didn't. So that's population test, just simply. There's a smarter way of doing this. There's this paper by uh, Peng Wei and Percy Liang at Stanford. They use this thing called influential functions. It's a pretty well-known function in outside of the machine learning community to determine which images in the training that was most influencing prediction of this picture. So what they showed, uh, this is kind of a hypothesis, I guess, is that Inception is more expressive and learn better representation that picked out this fish that are actually relevant, whereas SVM, which have, might have learned more superficial, superficial picture features, had just picked out pictures that have similar color. Uh, the challenge with this kind of method is that it's computationally very expensive. You gotta invert some matrices, and once you do pseudo inverse, things kind of fall apart. But there has been a lot of nice work, a follow up to make this method a little more efficient. 
second method, which I'm going to talk, uh, spend quite a bit of time on, is sensitivity analysis, fitting linear model, or uh, function uh, gradient-based methods. So these are all kind of similar flavor. What do I mean? Well, here's Lime method. You probably who have who have heard of Lime. So okay, cool. So this is like one of the uh, most widely used uh, methods. What they do is really simple and elegant. What it is is you have this decision boundary, looks like a red class and a blue class, and you have a mod data point that you want to explain. Then what you do is you randomly sample data points around you, and then you fit a linear function. And now you have a linear function, and you look at the weights and see which one, which feature was important or not important. Now, if you're thinking, uh, is that work? then your intuition might be right. It's a, it's a very uh, sensitive method. Depending on how you sample the data, your linear, your linear classifier might be all over the place. There's a nice work uh, by a couple of people from MIT that showed the robustness, the lack of robustness of Lyme, and after that, uh, a body of people moved in to improve the robustness of such methods. Another body of method is called saliency maps. I'm gonna talk at length about this. What is saliency map? Uh, it's, you have a picture like this and you get, ended up getting picture like that. What is it? Well, you just look at every single pixel and you take first order derivative of the probability of like starfish with respect to every single pixel in this image. If that means intuitively, if I change this pixel a lot and the probability changes quite a bit, that means that the pixel is important. It's just a simple sensitivity test. And we build bells and whistles around it to make it fancier. Uh, and that's body of work called saliency map. A lot of them are based on gradients. And you get, end up getting uh, images, like quite, uh, images like this, where this is a vanilla gradient and this method, oh yeah, this is my work. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll criticize this work very soon. Uh, after you do, do some fancy things, you get something more kind of uh, like the tower. Uh, first problem with this type of uh, approach is that when you look at just one data point at a time, you're looking at basically this. This is first one of the feature F1. You're taking first order derivative of probability of the class. Now, because you're locally fitting this linear function, you might have these two data points, that guy and that guy that are very similar in both values of F2 and F1, but has completely different explanation. Because God knows what your function does. Your functions might be very picky where the explanation will be all over the place. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, well a couple problems. If you, uh, pr if you present explanations that are conflicting and human look at it and they're like, go, huh, these two patients look very similar, but they have a completely different explanation. It's a matter of time that you completely lose the, the, the confidence from and, and the expert might say, ah, yeah, no, no, thank you. Machine learning is not ready. And the second problem is that as a human, even if this is true, as a human, it's really hard to grasp the whole idea because we, we have a limitation in our memory. If you want to have a, some general notion of how this model works, this may not be the way that you want to do. Here's a second uh, problem. So again, just to, just to uh, uh, recap our problem definition, the problem is you have a model that someone else trained and uh, your goal is to answer what was the evidence of prediction? What caused the prediction? So for example, you have a neural network, paste a picture like this and predicts that this is Junko bird. Cool, so then I'm asking, why was this a Junko bird? So saliency map will give you something like this. And what this means, and this is important, that these pixels are evidence of predictions. These pixels are why this bird is predicted as a bird. So cool, that sounds fine. Uh, then we can ask some simple sanity check question. If these pixels are the evidence of prediction, then when the prediction changes, then the explanation should change. In fact, we can think about an extreme case. When we make the network garbage, just randomize everything, then the explanation should really change. Now the network is garbage, didn't know, don't know anything about the bird, then in the probability, there's a very low chance that 
by accident, you will have the same explanation. So we did that test. This is work with uh, some PhD student at, at MIT, Julius. What we did is uh, the following. We took a network that's been beautifully trained, predict doing the right thing, and get this, we got this salience map. And we saw, okay, well, the belly of the bird seem important, the cheek of the bird seem important, okay, sure, fine. Then we took that same network and we start randomizing the layer, starting from the top all the way to the bottom. And after all, you have a completely random network. So this network, we just completely initialize the weight. It doesn't know anything. It had no backward test whatsoever. So you would think the explanation should change. It doesn't. And when we first saw this, we were like, oh, oh, this is bad. Uh, like many years, a lot of people had put work on this, including myself. What is happening? Well, but you might, you might see, look at these two pictures and say, well, you know, it's not the same picture. Uh, there's a sky a little darker than the other one and so on. But remember, the only reason we're doing this work is for you to consume, the you, the humans. And as a human, I don't know if I will draw a different conclusion based on these two pictures. The belly looks pretty important still and the cheek still important. And if they look the same to you and to me, I think that's a problem. So we did this for many methods. Let me actually show you the next picture. Oh, it's not here. Okay. Uh, we added a lot more methods. Uh, so we did a lot of different methods. This is a vanilla gradient. This is uh, smooth grad is one of my work. Um, gradient input and, and integer gradients and so on. And as you can see, some methods rarely change as we randomize the top layer all the way to the bottom layer. So we are randomizing this in a cascading fashion, like accumulated way. So at the last column, you're looking at a completely random network, completely random, completely reinitialized. And even the first, the second column here, the prediction is random. Prediction is completely garbage. But except perhaps for, for grad camp, although it somehow recovers where the bird was, uh, a lot of a lot of other methods seems to be pointing at where the bird is. So we are shocked by this result, and we say, "Okay, well, let's do something else crazy." Uh, we yes. Uh, thank you. Great question. Yes, the darker red or purple is a uh, is a more important than the whiter one. I'm not completely sure. So it, when you, when the network is completely random, it's just a random projection, right? It's a it's an input image, and it take that image and randomly project that image into some dimension, higher dimension, and you shrunk it, right? I'm not sure how much, and I can make this random weights in any way I want. Doesn't have to be Gaussian. We initialize to be, I, I believe we initialize to be Gaussian or Wasserstein, but it doesn't have to be. So I don't know if this will still carry. It might, but st still carry the statistics of the image. Uh, no, this is like a completely random, I don't think it's we're doing, we, we haven't tried anything, we haven't trained anything, right? So there's no batch norm, normalization during training, nothing. But uh, we'll think about, I'll take your question in a bit, uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, another uh, deep image prior work that came out in NeurIPS uh, 17, which uh, observed very similar symptom. The culprit is convolution operation. So it turns out that convolution operation itself is a, such a good feature extractor, even if it was never trained, which is kind of shocking, and I don't understand why. Uh, but it just does. So if you have a completely random network, and you pipe in image, so this is untrained, and you collect activations in some layer, and use that activation to train a separate network, as like linear classifier or SVM. Again, this is like a random projection, right? But apparently it works pretty well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fun to be in this field. Like every day, like, shocking results comes out. And you're like, what? Great question, great question. We don't know, and I think that's the problem. So I'll talk about a method that I think of after seeing this uh, failure mode to kind of go over that idea of having to, uh, that being constrained into a, a pixel space. I'll talk about that. We, we can use higher level concepts like color, like texture, or like something else. And I'll talk about that method very soon. Oh no, we had like thousand. 
we took the intersection V3, which has 1,000 classes. Great question. So if you get the vanilla gradient, and there's a lot of work doing this, they call it discriminatability. Uh, if you have two classes in the image and you're taking the gradient with respect to one class versus the other, then this two should be different, right? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of methods, including mine, uh, doesn't really have that. If there's a, a thing in the middle and dog and a cat, then it will say happily say all the things in the middle, I like it. But there are methods who, dis to, who uh, uh, try to distinguish and add this as a loss fun function to do that. I don't think in this sanity check uh, uh, context, I don't think anything would change just because you have two, because it's already four. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I like this question and I got this question a lot. I think the problem is that the promise was that these are, these pixels are why this bird is a bird. It, I didn't say, here are a set of pixels that might or may or may not be the cause of the prediction. So if the claim was that it's a recall, that I will give you some hundred things and maybe one of them might cause the prediction, then I think perhaps, but even then I have some questions, why do they, those two happen to be exactly the same? And my conjecture is that convolution operation itself is just looking at the image, it loves the image and it loves the edges because it is kind of trained to pick up the edges. And by getting the, somehow the first order gradient, even, even though it was with respect to the probability final logit layer, it is still highly biased to just the image itself. And it has less to do with prediction. It might have to do something with prediction, but not as much as you think it is. So like extending this farther, let's say you have a, uh, I, I think about this a lot, like you have a cancer image, right? And you're, you're uh, some big company put out a medical tool that says, here's a cancer image, here's your, your my, my own cell, uh, uh, cell specimen. And then here, your doctors will look at saliency maps to tell whether you have a cancer or not. I will be very worried. I don't know if it's getting to pre precision, is it a recall? By having some attention map, am I biasing the doctor to miss this other feature that she, he or she should have seen? That's, I, I will be worried. Yes. I see, I wish I have other pictures. Uh, we're not cherry picking. So uh, to answer, actually, this is a good point to point out. We do quantitative evaluations in the paper over like many, many pictures, like 10,000 or so, where that's not necessarily true. Yeah. And we do three different metrics because none of these metrics are, are perfect. Pierce, Pierce uh, correlation coefficients and other computer-based vision method where it compares similarity between two things. I think, it I think it depends on the method. So let's look at it. Um, I think for this guy, like this thing is definitely more birdy than this random thing. This is completely random and this is only one layer random. But grad cam, I don't know what this is doing, but it kind of recovers, somehow recovers the bird again. So I think it depends. I think that's a, a open question. I think it's an interesting question, but you, we do see an amazing performance on language transfer, which doesn't have convolution layers. But I think there's something special about convolution layer for sure that we don't, a lot of them we don't understand. Maybe we need scientists to work on it. <laughs> I will take this, you have the question? You have a question? Yeah. Cool, all right. So we can take, we can talk about this a little bit more later on, but let's move on to my next crazy experiment. So we were shocked by this and we said, okay, let's do something again crazy. What we did is we took a MNIST data set and we shuffled the labels and we trained the network. So this time we trained the network, but with random labels. And we got some results for saliency maps. And remember this network never learned what zero is because zero was uh, zero to nine, all the digits are randomly labeled. However, if you look at this explanation, I can still kind of see the number zero. Yeah, it is pretty different, but still, if I were given just that explanation, I'm not sure if I can tell these are uh, saliency maps from random model, random label model. Not surprisingly, but perhaps surprisingly, the vanilla gradient seems to be better at revealing the truth than others. And remember all these fancy methods, are using vanilla gradient as an ingredient and doing some, uh, putting some bells and whistles. Right. So what is this? What can we learn from this? Well, it's something that I, 
uh, very often encounter is our confirmation bias. So this entire field of saliency maps has been developed many years. We looked at, many people looked at these pictures and they expected to see a bird. They saw a bird, they liked it. This is right, including myself. I had, I had worked in saliency maps too. And that's something that we repeatedly see that when humans see an evidence that agrees with your hypothesis, we love it. We're like, of course it's right, of course I'm right. And that's something that it's a feature of us, it's maybe not a bug, uh, and, but it's something that we have to take into account when we're designing these methods. Uh, I briefly talked about this, about the deep image prior work by Valdi et al. Another paper also mathematically proved that some of these methods are just reconstructing the images. It has nothing to do with prediction around the same time. However, some of these papers have gone out of their way to check with doctors and experts to see whether this, having these maps are helpful. And they show that they did. So perhaps there is something, perhaps something that they're showing some candidate set of pixels. Maybe it's useful in some way. But we need to start do a lot more study to figure out what was it and how do we amplify that signal. Uh, recent work by Sanjeev Aurora uh, from Princeton uh, followed up and suggest a very simple, elegant fix to pass this test, which I find a pretty awesome, awesome start. But, you know, this is really a low bar test. Come on, like we should have been passing this test long time ago. I can't believe it took many, many years to come up with this dumb test. So I, we, we paused and thought, well, what if uh, there's harder tests? Can we came up with a harder test? So this is what we did. This is work with Sherry at, at Brain. The goal is to have a benchmark so that you can evaluate your interpretability methods. And this is, I roughly alluded to, we make up a data set such that we know which part of the data set is important or shouldn't be important. And we see, show how the attribution methods do or saliency method maps do. So how, do we do, how did we do this? We took mini places data set. This has just a bunch of scenes, forest, kitchen, stadium. And then from another data set, MS Coco, we took a patch of object uh, uh, cutout pieces. So here I have a dog and I also have backpack and other 10 different things. Then we pasted this thing to every single scene images for all scene classes. And what is the, well, dog is everywhere. Dog is in every single picture. So dog is not important for classifying scenes. And we verify this in more computationally in the paper, but we showed that, yeah, dog doesn't matter in the prediction because I know I made up this data set. So attribution method or saliency method should not highlight the dog. So, and we can make a second step, and that's what I just said. We can make it this even more complicated by saying, okay, I can only add the dog to some classes, just the forest. Then dog is now giving signal to classify the forest class. Then the attribution in forest class should be higher than any other dogs in any other classes. And we can do this relatively uh, one by one and have like a relative measure. So that's what we did in our paper. Uh, we suggest three metrics as a start for measuring, but we focus on false positives. Um, I think interpretability method have very similar history uh, that will come in, in a way that we measure how good this thing is. So in, in, in traditional machine learning, we first started with accuracy, and then we say, oh wait, maybe the precision and recall mattered. And then we went to AUC, and then now we're thinking about robustness, adversarial tag, and all sorts of other things. This is like all good things that different metrics. And I think similarly, we're in the very beginning stage of that interpretability method. We're going to come up with metrics that matters to your task. There's, not, there's no one metric that's good for everything. So here, what we mean by false positive is when interpretability method said it's important, but model didn't think so. So that's just the part of the metric that we are focusing on in this data set. And we suggest three metrics. I'm gonna talk about a little more about the first one, but briefly the second and the third one. What we did here, input dependence rate, is we took a picture and we 
did the optimization stochastic, stochastic gradient descent to make a dog really, really important. And the question is, well, now I made it really, really important. We know it because we optimized for it. Then attribution should increase. Input independence rate, this is kind of like an adversarial example. Uh, how many people, have you had adversarial example uh, lecture yet? No, mm. oh, okay. I see, okay, cool. So uh, input independence rate is something like, I'll again take a picture, and I place the dog in a location, and I only change that dog pixels such that the network actually doesn't see the dog. I can do this using gradients. I make sure that every single layer, nothing changes when I add this pixel. And this is kind of basis of other serial examples, that if you change something, I can either make network go crazy, or I can make the network do nothing. This is just simple radiant-based uh, uh, attack or approach. So that's what we do in those two uh, measures. So these three metrics measures different things, different, uh, different things that might be, might be differently important depending on your task. But let me talk a little bit about the model contrast score here. Uh, we train two models. The first model is, this is better, yeah. The first model is trained to classify scenes. So forest, stadium, kitchen. The second model is trained to classify objects. So it's dog, it's backpack, and so on. And we expect this, where the dog would have been, should be very different in these two models. And that's the score that we measure. We do this for many, many images, 10,000, I believe, and we average them. And here is a quantitative measure of using this metric, model contrast score. Uh, this is a grad cam. This is all the method that you just saw in the previous uh, uh, section, vanilla gradient, smooth gradient, and so on, and the TCAP, which uh, is the technique that I'm going to talk about soon. Um, the scale of this is one. One is the best, although there's a little nuance there. Higher the better is the message that you should take away from. Uh, this data set is open sourced. We are open sourcing model and everything, so that hopefully when we are doing this, we don't make this mistake again, that we're kind of doing the ostrich thing where like things don't work, but like, you don't want to see it. So sanity check doesn't pass on your method. We, we just kind of want to ignore it. Let's, let's not do that. Let's evaluate. And this is like low bar again. Like you can do much better, more sophisticated tests. And we can make better uh, benchmark data set too. But this is a starting point. What this work gives us, however, is a, a wish list. What could we have done better? Um, so the saliency map relied on the cue that is uh, based on human. Human has to look at it, and they have to subjectively judge, uh, like what you said, like, oh, belly is important, so maybe it's the shape of the belly, maybe it's the texture of the belly. Like, it, you have to reason. And it used the pixel as a module, but, you know, humans don't think in pixels. I don't go look at this dog picture and say, look at the pixel number 2.135, isn't it cute? I say, oh, the fluffy thing, that's cute, right? So maybe we can have something, some more quantitative quality function and use something more human friendly, high level concepts like fluffiness or texture or color instead of the pixel, which is artificial. And perhaps that will help us to help lay person to understand machine learning models better. You don't have to know that computers process uh, images in pixels. Because we could have been living in a world where analog computers are everywhere. It didn't have to be digital. Well, I guess there were some reasons why it had to be digital, but maybe there's a parallel universe where everyone is using analog computers and we will be living in a completely different space. Pixels are not, not the way that we, we communicate. Uh, what else can we do? Well, local understanding is important in case of like court cases or medical, understanding one data point is important, but sometimes you just wanna get a kind of idea of what this model does. So we're gonna try global understanding. So again, problem is the same. We have post-training explanation. You have a model, it's given to you. You have a, a input data going in and it says, I'm a cash machine. And the question is, why are you a cash machine? Let's use the saliency map that we've been uh, hammering uh, to help us think about what do we really want as an explanation. So here is a, sal a type of saliency map for this picture. Now, as I stare at this very carefully, 
I see this human in front of the cash machine. So that made me think, oh, maybe the existence of a human concept in this picture mattered in cash machine prediction. And oddly, this cartwheel behind the human is also highlighted. That's a little weird, why the cartwheel? Perhaps that also mattered for some weird reason. And if these concepts did matter, I would like to know which one mattered more. Because if a human mattered more, that may be a little more comforting than if the wheels mattered more. And whether this is true for all cash motion pictures, should I be worried about this or not? So more global explanation. Who watched Rick and Morty? If you haven't, I highly, highly recommend. Uh, it, <laughs> it, it took me a while to get used to it. It's, I think it's a very uh, West uh, American culture. I grew up in South Korea. But like once you get used to it, it's beautiful, uh, beautiful episode. Looking forward to the next season. I'm not getting paid to say this, but I love Rick and Morty. This is a character in Rick and Morty where, where he always says like, I can do, I can do something. But anyway, uh, uh, our, our character says, oh no, but we can express these concepts that we want the explanation for, like humans and wheels in pixel, especially across many images. And it, was, it would have been fine if you had these two things as an input features, but you didn't. I just came up with it. I just looked at this picture and I had this insight of, oh, the humans, of course, humans are always in front of the cash machines. So you didn't have that. So wouldn't it be great if we have a quantitative way to measure how important these concepts that you just came up with? So that's what we did, testing with concept activation vectors, TCAV, uh, I really wish I had named this taco. I regret, I regret this deeply, but I couldn't quite figure out how to put the O in there. Uh, so it's called TCAV. And what it does is you have a concept like race or gender that you want to measure whether that was important in your prediction. Uh, and we can give you quantitative explanation only if the concept was indeed important, even if the concept wasn't part of the train. So let's be concrete. Here's a concrete example. Let's say you have a model that takes a picture and predicts whether there was a doctor in the picture or not. And I want to know whether the gender concept mattered in this prediction. TCAV is like a microscope that gets attached to the model. So it's a white box interpretability method. I have to know what's going on inside of the model. And give you number between 0 and 1, a TCAV score, whether or not a woman mattered how much compared to uh, other concepts like woman. And it does so if and only if the concept actually mattered, and I'll talk about how we can test this, if it thinks that the concept, crazy concept that you came up with didn't have anything to do with the prediction, then it will say, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry, I can't give you an answer. All right, so for the running example, we're going to have a zebra. And I am curious whether striped concept was important in predicting zebra or not. So first and foremost, you may say, okay, the concept, high level concept, it makes sense, but what do you even mean by this? Like, how do you get this? How do you express this? We do the simplest possible thing. What is it? Well, you, the user, provide some examples of the concepts, like in this case, striped knit shirts. And you also provide some random images. As long as the majority of them are not striped, you're fine. And you get this net, you have this network that you, you already trained that you're interested in interpreting. Now what we do is we simply collect the activation, activation F of L for these pictures, the concept pictures and the random pictures. And you simply just uh, classify, train a linear classifier that separates the two and find the vector that is orthogonal to the decision boundary. And what is this vector? Well, it's just a vector that points from random activation directions to concept activation direction. This is not new. This is like uh, talk of Vincent talked about work to vector vector of the gender, although that's by the, 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 the nuance there. Uh, the, the linearity of a, such a high level concept has been shown in over and over again in many papers. And we're just doing that the same thing. It's just the simplest way. Oh, now we have this vector. What are we going to do with this vector to get that quantitative score that I talked about, TCAV score? It's also really simple. 
I think to this audience in particular, it might be a really toy example. But we use directional derivative. What is it? Well, you just take the probability of the zebra and take the derivative with respect to that vector that we just got, the stripedness vector. So what does this do intuitively? Well, it means if I move my image to slightly to more like the concept, slightly less like the concept, how much would the probability of the zebra swing? If it swings a lot, it's an important concept. If it doesn't, it's not an important concept. It's pretty simple. And we do this for many zebra pictures. And we do this simplest thing, which is to say, well, among all the zebra pictures I have, how many of them in return the positive directional derivative? In other words, if I had 100 zebra pictures, how many zebra pictures having the concept increase the probability of a zebra? Now, this is simplest uh, definition. You can put on inequality, you can flip this to uh, test the negation or absence, all sorts of things that fit your bill, but this is just one number that's simplest. So, great. That's pretty much the entire framework. It's very simple. I view this as like a, a canvas that someone else that's smarter than me can go and make it fancier and more maybe uh, principled and, and nicely complete. But that's really it. That's the base. Yes. We have a follow work that, Mar that we're trying to discover concepts. I'll talk about that a little bit. It's a lot harder. If we solve the problem, we solve AI. Oh, it's, it's actually not true. It's an interesting, it's an important insight that the concept actually doesn't have to come from the training distribution. It, could, it doesn't have to be zebra. These are, um, these are actually just the clothing the, from clothing features. Oh, no, that wouldn't work. Yes, that would not work. Yes, that would be a lot harder. Like try to express zebra in words. Also, if instead, if the concepts are, yeah, if the network is trying to do images, but you want to express concept in words, that's difficult. <laughs> yes, I thought you were asking something else. So, uh, but one more question here. Um, we have this calf that we learn in embedding space, but we know that in high dimensional space, things are funky. But the Bercero example actually uh, leverages that, well, a type of, uh, characteristics is because it's high dimensional, our intuition is out the window, so things are a little funky. So we want to make sure that the calves that we, a calf we have, didn't return sensitivity, the high directional derivative, by chance. So there's two ways to check this, uh, qualitatively and quantitatively, but I'll only show you the one that's quantitative. Uh, here's one way to check that. So here, remember we learned this calf using random set of pictures? These are random set of pictures. So you can have as many random set of pictures as you want, because so they're random. From each, each set, you will have a calf. So you end up having many, many calves. Then given a target class that you would like to explain, you have many, many t cap scores. So those averaged number of how many zebras return positive directional derivatives. And then you can see these as a samples from a distribution. And if you, if your stripedness was higher, high important for a zebra class, you will see something this nice Gaussian distribution like this. Then what we do is we train a, a, another set of calves that are random. So a random concept. What does that mean? It just means that instead of stripes, we're gonna put some random pictures. But pictures or data points that are from still from roughly training distribution. So this is like meaningless concept as a straw, as a as a, a counterpart, and we're gonna do some t testing or Welsh testing better uh, to say whether this the mean of these two distributions are statistically significantly different, and only then we say this concept might mean something. I think there are better tests. If you have a better, tighter test, let me know. I'd love to hear. Uh, but it's a starting point. Uh, I think it's better than better than nothing. So that's what we do. A qualitative test is actually better, that you, you sort your input pictures with respect to the calf that you train and see if it aligns with your concept of that, 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 uh, that your concept of that concept. And if it doesn't, then that means your calf is not good. I think that's a second way, a double proof, this in addition to quantitative method. So that's it. Uh, I'm gonna show you some results. I might. 
Steve sometimes for the questions. So I'm going to pass maybe uh, skip the sanity check experiment. What this does is simply, uh, oh, I guess I didn't include it. So it's, I did a very similar thing with the dog and scene example, and I confirmed that uh, TCAV is able to match at least this toy case, the truth. And we compare that with saliency maps. We do human experiments to show that saliency map misled people very easily. And when they're misled, they're very confident that their answers are right because again, they see what they like and they say, I'm as confident as I will ever be. So it's a, it's an, it's a, I, I like this, uh, my favorite part of the results section. But second, while we were excited after the sanity check experiments, we were like, okay, let's go wild and run this to the widely used Im image classification network. So we did that. We tested different types of concepts, uh, colors, uh, race, and objects. For the first color concept, uh, we tested for fire engine. The red and green comes out high. Green's high because a lot of fire engines are on grassy field, we, we found. Now, this makes sense unless you're from Australia. Anybody from Australia? Nobody. Okay, I actually met somebody who knew exactly where this picture was taken from. It's from Canberra. It's not everyone in Australia. It's just the Canberra, the capital. Uh, and there's this fire station that does uh, that has a yellow fire engine. In fact, yellow fire engines are better than red. Can anyone think of why? Oh yeah, good point. Actually, maybe that's another reason. <laughs> <laughs> but there's slightly different reason. Yellow is better. Oh, perhaps that's another reason. <laughs> so the, the reason was that it's, it can be better seen in night. Red is harder to see at night. So there's like a paper is actually written by, uh, 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 I guess, psychologists or, or environmental researchers that we should all be using yellow fire trucks. Why are we still using red trucks? But, you know, when we looked at this graph, it made sense to us, but it wouldn't make sense to people from Canberra, Australia. And that's showing some geographical bias that the model might have learned. And other, of course, racial biases that we confirm with the, uh, that's consistent with previous findings. And if you remember the very first Deep Dream blog post where they classified dumbbells and they showed, oh, we found this neuron number by, I don't know, 37, 38, uh, that shows muscular arms. And they say, oh, maybe dumbbell classification muscular arm is relevant. So I wanted to test this. So I went and Google searched uh, arms and other object images. And we can now quantitatively say, yeah, arms did matter. And for this case, uh, I didn't have this data set, so I collected 33 examples of arms from Google image and it passes statistical testing and everything. And in fact, this is something that was surprising as I have more people at Google using this method People find uh, there's, you just don't need that many examples to learn that factor. Also, there's a big caveat that maybe there are some domains that you cannot, you do need more concept examples, but we've seen like 15 to 33 was the right uh, number for images, cancer images, uh, and other, other images that we used. So going back to the goal that we initially started with, and I'm hoping that some of these tools that we develop is helpful for you to ensure that your values are aligned in your model. So really excited, uh, we wanted to go to real domain, uh, which is working with doctors. We looked at diabetic retinopathy application. Diabetic retinopathy, or DR, is a treatable uh, symptom, a treatable condition. That if you discover early, you don't lose your sight, but if, if you discover late, uh, uh, that's not good news. So medical brain has this model that can classify DR pretty well. But our question was, well, is this model using something that doctors use? Is it using as if it's a, it's a doctor making the decision? Because people are looking into this model and deploy it to areas where there are no doctors. So we went to a doctor in, in brain and we asked her, can you tell us the concepts that you would be looking for for this level of DR? This is most severe level of DR, and what are the concepts that you don't look for? And we did the same thing for another class. Then we asked the model using TCAV, what do you think? 
So for model that it's for the class that was most severe. So at this point, the hope is lost. Um, it looks like it's doing what doctors would have done. The green ones are the ones that doctors would like to see. It's high, red is low, that makes sense. And the accuracy, model's accuracy is pretty high. Story is a little different when the model's accuracy is a mediocre. So this is most mild level of the R. And in that case, it looks like the model is paying attention to a concept that doctors would have not looked at. So we were puzzled by this and we dig farther and we found out that DR level one has a lot of confusion with DR level two even for doctors, the, the next level of a severe, severe level of DR. And the DR level two has a lot of this feature. It's like a hemo, ha, what you call it, like the, the vessel kind of being blown up, hemo, oh, I'm blanking the name, but it's, it's that like observing the blood vessel that's being blown out or, or swollen. So that, that was a mystery that they realized that, oh, the, we, we should probably clean up the label before uh, going farther. And again, I think this brings us back to the goal where when we want to confirm that domain expert knowledge is being used in the way that we would have been used, and that's what you want, one of the things you want to know, this tool might be useful. It's also important to know that, and some of the things that uh, folks pointed out, uh, limitations of TCAP. First limitation is that concept has to be expressible using examples. If you want to express something higher level, like love or some other uh, higher level, the super higher level things, I don't know how to do that. A TCAP wouldn't work for you. And users need to give the concept. So I find it really interesting. It, this divides people into two, like the um, uh, HCI folks and uh, domain experts love this. They say, oh yeah, I can give you examples and now it can speak my language. Whereas if you talk to anyone in brain, they'll be like, yeah, but can you automatically discover it? <laughs> can you put the humans out of the loop and, and see if we can do this all automatic? Uh, and I think both problems are important. One that you can impose a language on the model and, and, and two, discover something that maybe we never knew before. And that's, a, that's TBD. We have a follow up work that's submitted to discover concepts by form of image patches. So in this case, for example, uh, we, we have patches of images that consistently discover the basketball concept. However, the danger of this is that when humans see these patches, for example, when you see these patches, what's the concept? Right, anything else? Right, the first thing that people think of is floor. However, what if it was brown color? Like again, you, you're kind of injecting your confirmation bias uh, when you interpret this new concept. So that there's a plenty of challenge left here to how to uh, tease that out. Yeah, you can hardly see, it's like a, this thing in the floor of the basketball court. Ah, I see. So there are three pictures of basketball class pictures and our goal was to find a patch of pixel that consists of, that can make a cluster, and that becomes our new concept, discovered concepts. And we discovered this concept cluster, and these are just small patch, just zoomed in, blown up. And there are many like arms and like balls and other things. So there's a, there's a lot of work there. Uh, also, it's important to note that none of these are causal. I think causal inference uh, plays important role in inter interpretability. We recently worked on uh, extending this work to causal TCAV, but computations are really hard or a lot harder. For, to do this, you need a VAE for your model and things get kind of complicated. You have to add a lot of assumptions. We have to have a causal graph that assumes there's no other confounding than anything, everything else that, that we listed in the causal graph. There's a, a trade-off, but you can do this. Um, cool. Code is there if you wanna look at. And uh, here's a self-promoting uh, slash uh, 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 slide. Uh, I was I was thrilled that uh, like regular people who are not in computer scientists that really started looking at this, which made me so excited because my original goal was to build a tool for lay people who is who are actually doing like saving people and solving problems out in the world, not like a, a PhD from computer science, a doctor. 
on the fake doctor, I think. Uh, well, oh, actually, maybe many of you guys are also doctors. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I call myself fake doctors. So soon I talked about it at Google I.O., which was awesome. It made my dad happy more than anything. Uh, I went to UNESCO in Paris to receive this award. Uh, the UNESCO Center has like this professional stage that was pretty awesome experience. I also was thrilled to see uh, responses from inside of academia. There's this paper. I'm part of it, but I didn't do much work. It's really Carrie, Carrie Kai's work. Uh, she used this concept vector to help doctors to sort images. This is a uh, really pro prostate cancer uh, uh, pieces of cell pictures, and doctors found it very useful. And this was uh, one of the best paper on our mission at this CHI conference, top HCI conference this year. Forgot to put this, but a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, I, I met this person from Aerospace uh, Incorporation. His name is Eric, and he used TCAP to pre interpret. Uh, a model that predicts storms. So he used like, is this storm cat four? Why? Is it about the eye of the storm? Is it about something else, color of the other things? And he came over to me uh, to tell me that I need to add it uh, here, but that, that's awesome. Another student in Switzerland uh, extended this work for regression models and tested on breast cancer data, work with doctors to show that this is useful. So uh, we have a couple more minutes. We talked about these three methods. However, I think there's a lot more interesting things that I didn't cover. Adversarial attacks, you can attack interpretability method and make it completely screw up, totally possible. Uh, you want some robust explanation, things change a little bit, you still want to give stable explanation. Another thing that I think I'm getting more and more, more excited these days is interpretability for science. Uh, can you interpret a superhuman performance model to discover something that we didn't know before? Can we add a piece of knowledge to the knowledge of human humanity? I think that's a very exciting topic. And I think a lot of people in this audience specifically uh, would love to collaborate if you have interesting data, if you have a model that's interesting, either about earthquake or uh, mental health, depression or autism, that sort of thing. I'm super excited. Let me know if you're interested. Uh, Bin Wu at Berkeley is doing some awesome work on uh, looking at neuroscience and genomics on interpretability for science. So for the interest of time, I'm going to skip this part. I think I already uh, lectured that we need to do evaluation properly. We need to remember humans are biased and irrational. If you love reading uh, Undoing Project by Danny Kahneman, uh, uh, winning uh, the Nobel Prize winner of economics, he wrote, uh, well, I guess someone else wrote that book of Undoing Project. Um, that's beautifully describing what kind of crazy biases humans have and that we can't get away with it. It's a beautiful book, highly recommend. We need help from HCI community who knows how to build a interface, design a workflow, very important, and so on. And I think it's, uh, I'm a dog person, I, but I like putting cats in the slides. <laughs> They're funny. I think it's a really exciting time to be in the field of interpretability. There's so much things we can do and help people so that they want to do the right thing and we can help them to do the right thing and give them the power to be more responsible. Thank you.